remind me if I forget because I get too into the class and I forget to let's just wait for it to record. Cool. All right. So we're recording. Anyway, so we've spoken about disease, disruption of homeostasis, and we said infectious diseases are caused by pathogens. Now the word patho refers to disease. Patho or pathology is a study of disease. It's one of the most interesting disciplines of study in medicine. You find out what's abnormal in disease, right? Gen refers to something that generates the aforementioned term. So a pathogen is any agent that is generating disease. Everyone with me? What are some examples of pathogens? Uh, I'll go to someone who was here yesterday. Muhammad, can you give us one or two examples of a pathogen you know? COVID-19. Very good. Very good. Causing agent all around us, right? Um, interestingly, you know, COVID is still quite rampant. Just the other, other day in my hospital, one of my patients had a fever. And we didn't really know what the cause of this fever was. And then one of the medical staff decided, why don't we do a COVID test? And surprise, he was COVID positive, which was responsible for those fevers. So again, did you see how the disruption of his internal balance told us something was abnormal? And we did a PCR for COVID and we found out that it was an infectious disease causing it, right? Medicine is literally being a detective of, of homeostasis. All right, coming back to this, COVID is one example. Trissy, what are some other causative organisms that can cause disease? Isn't the um, infectious, like an infectious disease, like this infection, not infectious disease, sorry. Yes, those are two categories. But my question is, what are some other things that cause infectious disease? So we said COVID-19, which includes viruses. What are some other pathogens that we know of? Any others that we know? Sarah, on to you. There's so many. So many. Parasites. Very good, right? Uh, rarer, I wouldn't be thinking parasite if a patient has disease. It's much rarer in Australia and Sydney. What are some more common causes? If you look at the tip of your pen right now, hundreds to millions of them are looking right back at you, wondering why you haven't identified them. What is the other agent I'm talking about? The single-celled prokaryote that has a circular loop of DNA. Trissy, back to you. Um, bacteria. Yeah, bacteria and viruses make up the vast majority of pathogens. Everything else is a minority, but you still need to know it. Okay, so bacteria, viruses are the most important for you to know. Okay, sure, we have parasites. We have parasites that can be inside the body. We can have parasites that can be outside the body. For parasites that are inside the body, they're usually the worm-like parasites. We call them endoparasite. Endo means inside, right? And for parasites that are outside the body, we use the word ecto. Ecto or the word exo refers to outside body, okay? So exo or ectoparasites. Good. What else can we have? Ruthania. Fill in the rest of the gaps since you've done module seven. What are some of the other causative organisms? Um, there's prions, there's fungi. Yeah, um, you can have fungi. Protozoa. Yes, you can have protozoa. Good. And we'll learn how to categorize this. But if you remember module five, when we went through the different kingdoms, that'll help you a lot in characterizing these pathogens. Now, one of the most interesting ones are prion diseases. Prions are not even living organisms. That's why we're using the word agent and not organism when we define the word pathogen. Pathogens are disease-causing agents, not disease-causing organisms. Organisms implies it's alive. Some of these guys you see in this list are not even alive. They have no sentience. They just cause havoc to the human body. Prions, one of the nastiest diseases. Very, very, very rare. But the kinds of diseases they cause are extremely devastating. There's an example. I'll just give you one. There's one called familial 
fatal insomnia, FFI. Patients with this disease, they aren't able to sleep. They can't sleep. So what happens is day by day, they go extremely drowsy. You know, all the effects of sleep deprivation kick in. And this happens for months. Imagine not being able to sleep for months. How exhausted you get. They get seizures, tremors, memory problems, and eventually their immune system gets extremely weak. And these people die in a matter of months. And it usually onsets at about 40, 35 years of age. It's quite scary. And we'll talk about what causes that. It's these prions or these proteins, which are what prions are in the brain. Okay, very good. So we've understood now infectious diseases are caused by pathogens. What is another feature of infectious diseases? That's the first feature. What is the second feature of infectious diseases? Let's go to Muhammad. Muhammad, if I had Ebola, why would you be scared to come near me and have physical contact? It can be transmitted. Exactly, right? And the one thing I want you guys to be cautious of is when you say the word transmitted, that just means passed on. You've learned in Mod 5 and 6, genetic diseases, which are non-infectious, they're not caused by a pathogen, are also passed on. They're just passed on from parent to child. So that's vertical transmission, right? If you look back to your pedigrees, it's transmission down generations, right? So you just need to make the clarification that infectious diseases are transmitted horizontally. Okay. And we'll talk about the different kinds of transmission, right? Because I'm sure not many of you would know, you know, if someone has HIV, does their saliva have the disease? Can you touch them or will you get disease just from touching them? Or will you get disease from their blood, right? So all those questions will be answered when I explain to you how the different kinds of diseases are transmitted. Very good. Very briefly, we'll talk about non-infectious disease, okay? Just to set the groundwork for module eight. When I say a disease is non-infectious, again, it's not caused by a pathogen, and there's different categories. So, la so yesterday, I told you all three categories of non-infectious diseases you need to know for HC bio. Um, let's go to Critty. Critty, what is so one example of a category that causes non-infectious disease? Genetic. Yeah, very good. So in mod five and six, you learned a huge amount of genetics specifically relating to autosomal recessive diseases, autosomal dominant diseases. I'm just going to ask you all at random. Um, can anyone give me an example of an autosomal recessive genetic disease? It's all right if you don't know. The, the syllabus doesn't require you to, but I just want to see whether you can you can tell me a genetic disease for that matter. Trissy? Um, cystic fibrosis. Very good. The reason I said autosomal recessive is because I kept on harping on about cystic fibrosis all through five and six because it's a very high yield disease to understand, right? And does anyone remember how the disease comes about? What is the mutation? Is it a chromosomal mutation? Is it a point mutation? Any clues? It's a point deletion, right? It's a deletion of, of uh, one codon, the 508th codon um, on a chromosome that causes the uh, mutation of the chloride ion channel. And because of that, you get thick secretions in the lungs, in the intestines, in the skin. And one of the ways we test for cystic fibrosis is we do a chloride ion test. We literally get their sweat and we measure the chloride ion concentration. And if it's very high, that tells us there's something wacky going on with the chloride ion transporters in the body. Right. So genetic disease is very good. What's another category? Think about the main causes of death for people. This is it. This is how the scary thing you all need to realize. There is no such thing as dying of a natural cause. No such thing. There's always a cause of death that is a disease. It could be in your sleep. You pass away due to cardiac arrest. The heart stops, which is probably one of the easiest ways to die. And it's also very uncommon because most people don't die very easily. 
right? Most people end up by old age, end up getting cancer or they end up getting um, dementia, which causes malnutrition, impaired swallowing, they get pneumonia or um, elderly women are prone to getting fractures in their bones, which can result in immobility, cause blood clots in the lungs, right? So I just want you all to understand, you know, the process of dying, it is a natural process, but there is always a cause. Now, Muhammad, can you give us another category? Dietary, nutritional. Good, very good, right? In reality, right, nutritional or dietary diseases um, aren't that common. What I mean to say there is vitamin mineral deficiencies, like vitamin C dis deficiency causing scurvy is very rare. Right. But the syllabus still wants you to know nutritional diseases are a cause. In fact, I would say the main nutritional disease that's affecting humanity now is overnutrition. Right. There's there's a lot of foods that are very high in calorie that can contribute to obesity and obesity itself is a disease. Because what happens in obesity is the fat cells secrete hormones that increase your risk of cancers, inflammation throughout the body, heart disease, stroke. Right. So when you talk about nutritional, I want you guys to remember obesity, diabetes, um, but most of those diseases are multifactorial as well. What's a, what's another category? There's one more. Ruthania, can you? Oh, Sarah. Thanks for con offering, Sarah. What's the other example? Environmental. Very good. I love it when you guys are um, interactive and proactive answering. Good. Genetic environmental nutritional. We'll fill those blanks in, but just to give you one example of each, we said cystic fibrosis for genetic, for nutritional, there is obesity, which is too much nutrition, right? We'll talk about diseases of undernutrition, but just know they're very rare in Sydney and in developing developed countries, um, but there are some diseases in developing countries like marasmus or this or funky diseases. I wouldn't want you to search this up just yet, but there is a disease of undernutrition, especially protein, which is called kwashiorkor. Very rare disease. I don't expect you guys to know it, but if you search it up, you'll see, you know, uh, children in Africa have, you know, very thin and withered, almost dying, but their bellies are extremely big. Um, and that's due to lack of protein, which is causing fluid to transport to the abdomen. And that's due to osmosis. Um, less protein in the blood vessels means higher water concentration in blood. And remember, water always moves from high water concentration to low. So it moves out of blood into body cavities like the abdomen. So anyway, we'll come back to that. And then for environmental, I want you to remember the one disease will be ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease. So when you say the word heart disease, everyone, you, you are pr you're most likely referring to ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease is where there is a lack of oxygen. That is what ischemia means. Ischemia, lack of oxygen. So you can put next to here, decreased O2. That's usually due to blockage and arteries in the heart. Okay, good. Let's start with the first inquiry question. How are diseases transmitted? What do we currently understand about this? I'm just going to go across and ask you all to fill something in for me. So, Matthew, starting with you, how are diseases transmitted, Matthew? Uh, through contact. It could be good. blood, could be skin. Yeah. yeah, good, good. You'd be surprised in hospital the number of um, accidental needle stick injuries doctors give themselves, right? So when you're collecting blood from a patient, sometimes you accidentally poke yourself. And that causes a huge worry because if a patient is hep C, hepatitis C or B or HIV positive, then it's really scary in regards to whether you're going to get the disease as well, right? So contact, very good. Blood. Uh, Muhammad, how else can diseases be transmitted? So there's direct contact. We said blood. Anything else? Genetically. Sorry? Genetically. Genetically, so that's for non-infectious disease. Very good. I love how Muhammad realized for disease transmission, the answer is different for non-infectious and infectious. So non-infectious diseases can be transmitted genetically. Um, and it's good to mention that, especially in a long response answer, if they ask, you know, um, evaluate how diseases are transmitted, seven marks, a really good student would say disease transmission is different for infectious and non-infectious diseases. Most of the answer will still be about 
infectious diseases, right? Good. So there is genetics. But let's focus on infectious disease. So I really like that answer. Uh, let's go to Rithania. How else does transmission occur, Rithania? Um, vectors. What do you mean by vectors? Can you just explain to the class? Give me an example. Um, so, for example, like malaria, um, mosquitoes would be um, transmitting the diseases to other people because they carry it in their bodies. Good, good. So a vector is an agent that doesn't cause disease but helps transmit it. So a lay person would commonly say that malaria is caused by mosquitoes and they would be gravely mistaken. Mosquitoes simply harbor the pathogen or the causative agent for malaria in their digestive system. And when they suck your blood, the specific mosquito called the Anopheles mosquito, inside its gut will be the causative agent for malaria. And when it sucks blood, it will transport that causative agent into your bloodstream. And the causative agent is a protozoa, and it goes by the name plasmodium. OK, again, I'm going to teach all of this to you in much more detail later, but just appreciate that a vector is not causing disease itself. It is not a pathogen. It is simply an agent which helps facilitate a disease transmission. Most vectors are arthropods or insects, right? Uh, does anyone know any other mosquito uh, related diseases? So we've said malaria and this class has gone on for about 30 minutes, which means six children have already died from the start of class due to malaria. Every five minutes, someone dies, and it's usually children. Um, what are some other mosquito-related diseases? Anyone know? Dengue fever. It's also called bone break fever um, because the pain of dengue fever feels like your bones are breaking. There's Zika virus in mosquitoes, which causes a mild viral illness. In, in mums, but it can cause severe birth defects in children when they're being born. So um, pregnant women need to be very careful of that as well. So good. So the way I want you guys to appreciate disease transmission is that diseases can be transmitted as direct or indirect. And we're going to talk about this soon. Okay. But direct means there is some direct contact of the person's tissue or their body fluids, okay? So if I cough on you, that is still technically direct as long as my secretions fall directly on you. That's a small caveat I want you all to appreciate, okay? Direct contact refers to direct touching, but also refers to direct secretions that fall onto someone. OK, so direct contact. Or direct droplets. OK, and indirect refers to when there isn't direct contact. So an example would be if I sneezed on my hand and I touched a pole on a train and then I went off my stop and you came and touched the same pole and then you rubbed your nose and four days later you got COVID-19, that's indirect transmission because I didn't directly touch you, nor did my secretions directly touch you. It was indirect through that pole. Okay, so key thing here, I don't expect you to explain what direct and indirect is just yet, but just know when it comes to transmission, there are direct forms of transmission and indirect forms of transmission. Okay, very good. Any questions so far? OK, one thing to note, this first dot point, is we'll need to investigate the different pathogens that cause disease. So you'll need to really understand what makes these bugs different. The usual exam question you're going to get is they'll describe a pathogen to you or they'll show you a microscope image of a pathogen and you will need to identify it. OK, so what I want you all to focus on here is when I tell you the name of a pathogen, you should be able to close your eyes and tell me, is it single-celled or multi-celled? Is it prokaryotic or eukaryotic? What unique features does it have under a microscope? Okay, that's what I want you guys to focus on. And then 
no one example of a disease that arises from that pathogen. Good. All right. So what I'll do first is this is the list. I'm going to give you guys a little exercise. You have 30 seconds. It's a very quick one. 30 seconds. Get your phones out because it's a rapid exercise. Um, I want you guys to pick one pathogen, Google search it, and tell me an important point about it. Give me any of them. You can give me an example of a disease. You can give me what structure it looks like. You can tell me how it's transmitted. I want you to pick any random one. Okay, and tell me an important fact about it. 30 seconds. I'll ask all of you to give me something interesting. Good. Be right back. I'm just going to get, I'm going to use the restroom quickly. All right, how do we go? Let's start with uh, Critty. What's one thing you learned about any of these pathogens? Um, I looked at bacteria. Okay. And basically, what's... it's transmitted to humans through like vectors. What we were talking about. Mm. And common. It can disease. be. It can be, but not always. So some bacteria can be transmitted through vectors, but most often bacteria just exist everywhere. Right, you're outnumbered ten to one by bacteria. Every human cell you have has ten bacterial cells on your body. Okay, it's very interesting because then for every human, we all have a unique microbiome, or city, or planet, or bacteria on our skin. And certain diseases, it's there's even hypothesized that the bacteria in your gut secrete chemicals that go to your brain and affect your cognition and thinking. And we found that in children with autism, they have a different uh, proportion of bacteria in their gut that's causing disease. Right? Autism is a neurodevelopmental disease. But my point being, bacteria are everywhere, so they don't need to be transmitted by a vector, like an insect. They just can be directly transmitted from anything. Um, let's go to Alyssa. Tell me an important point about any of these. I want you guys to be very quick because we need to keep moving. So, yep. I also did bacteria and I found out that um, even though they're everywhere, um, some of them can only be really harmful if they grow where they're not supposed to. Very good. Very good, right? So we found that 30% of doctors, because they work at hospital, are colonizers of a really nasty bacteria that goes by the name MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Basically what that means is this bug is resistant to most antibiotics. The reason it's not causing infection in those people, you know, I could have it right now just because of the amount of patients I've, I've examined, et cetera, that bacteria could colonize my skin. The only reason it's not causing infection is my skin barrier is blocking it. So it's at a place where it can't cause infection. But the second I get a cut in my skin, if the bacteria goes to my bloodstream, it is now in a spot where it can cause infection. So it's very good. Important to know that some bacteria um, can only cause infection in certain parts of the body, and they can only cause infection when they're in sufficient quantity to cause infection. I only get one bacteria going into my bloodstream, it's not going to cause infection. But if I have a big cut that isn't cleaned and hundreds and thousands of that bacteria get into my bloodstream, it might replicate sufficiently to cause disease. Good. Sarah? Oh, sorry, Sarah, you already said it. So uh, did you? I think, Sarah, have you mentioned anything? No. Okay. Give us something. Um, so I did protozoans and it's a unicellular eukaryote. Very good. In tissue damage. Very good, right? I really like that. She's identified to all of you 
exactly what a protozoa is. It is single-celled and eukaryotic. I need you all to write that down. It's a very important point, and we'll come back to that. All protozoa are single-celled and eukaryotic. So if you ever see a single cell under a microscope that has a nucleus and has an endoplasmic reticulum, if you say that is a bacteria, then I'll be disappointed because bacteria are prokaryotic. This is a eukaryotic unicellular organism, so it can be a protozoa. There's other things that are also unicellular and eukaryotic, so not every single single cell with membrane band organelles is a protozoa. We'll come back to and explaining that, but very good. Uh, let's go to Rithanya. Um, I did ectoparasites, so they're organisms that live outside the body. Good. Anything else you can tell us? Um, you want an example? Give me anything. Like fleas or like um, lice. What do all ectoparasites want, Rithanya? I'm asking you this because you finished Mod 7. So what are all ectoparasites after? Blood. Very good. All ectoparasites want blood for nutrition. Okay, so that's why they're outside the body. The only way they can obtain nutrients is by piercing the skin layer and obtaining blood from capillaries or arteries or veins. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, let's go to Trissy. Um, so I searched for um, virus and basically it could be caused by direct um, such as like coughing or like sneezing close contact or like body fluids or it can also be caused by like indirectly um so i had an example of smallpox which is caused by a uh, viruola virus that is good smallpox like is is eradicated except for an i think it's in a lab in china and i think it's in a lab in the u.s which is scary because if anyone gets their hands on the last sample of smallpox and spreads it even slightly will wipe out a huge proportion of the population. Smallpox is one of the, the nastiest viruses in mankind. Um, so it's really good we eradicated it. And guess how we did it? We did it through vaccines. Vaccines eradicated smallpox. Good. Uh, Mohammed, on to you. What I'm testing you guys here when I'm asking you to, to teach the class very briefly is whether you can find an important piece of information and explain it in a clear manner. Because that shows me you're good at synthesizing information. Mohammed. On to you. Uh, Ajit prions. A prion is a type of protein that can trigger normal proteins in the brain to fold abnormally. Very good. I like how clear that explanation was, right? Prions are proteins, full stop. So he's straight away told us it's not a cell. Next thing he's told us is it can induce or force other normal proteins to misfold, which is scary. It's kind of like a domino effect. A prion could represent a domino piece that's slipped and is now falling, and that can force all the other dominoes to also fall in that, you know, continuous um, domino arrangement. So that's what happens in the brain in prion diseases. For some reason or another, a normal protein goes from normal configuration to a diseased prion configuration, and that causes a domino effect that causes all the other proteins in the brain to misfold. And macroscopically, aka with a visual eye, when we post-mortem, when we look at the brains of patients with prion disease, they have holes. So it's usually withered and small. And under a microscope, we can see the holes in prion disease. It kind of looks like SpongeBob SquarePants. The reason I say that is under a microscope, we describe the holes caused by prion disease as a spongy form, meaning it looks like sponges, encephalopathy. Encephalo refers to the brain. This is brain. Or pathy. What does pathy mean, everyone? Let me ask Matthew. What does path mean? Heart uh, disease. Good. So Matthew has identified for us spongy form encephalopathy means sponge like brain disease, right? A lot of medicine makes sense when you break down what the words actually mean. Okay, good. Very good. And uh, last, Matthew, what's one thing you learned about pathogens? Uh, I did fungi. I just 
fungi eukaryote is multicellular organisms such as yeast that can be transmitted through direct skin contact or in, can be inhaled. Good, very good. Okay, so you, you, they're eukaryotic. Matthew, can they be? Do they only have to be unicellular, or can fungi be multicellular? Yeah, they can be both. Yeah, right. Mushrooms are multicellular fungi. You can see them with your eye. Yeast, you can't see. Um, but they can also cause disease as well. So very good point that fungi can be unicellular or multicellular. Very good. So now I'm going to show you how to put this all together because so far you must feel like, you know, you've got a lot of information, but it's all just messy, random bits and pieces about all these different causative agents. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to categorize this information into boxes in our head. When I think about pathogens, I think about whether they're cellular, meaning they're made up of cells, or they're acellular, aka they are non-living. When we talk about acellular pathogens, there are only two. There are prions, which are single proteins, and there are viruses that are made up of proteins and DNA. So we can probably further classify this. Maybe do it like, um, let me just pick. Where can I pick my colors? Okay, maybe I'll just do prion, which is a protein, and then viruses that are made up of protein and also DNA. Okay, now when we talk about cellular pathogens, there are a few we can talk about. So what pathogens are unicellular, everyone? There are two, if you remember, we went through this, that are unicellular only. They can never be multicellular. Uh, let's go to, let's go to the people that mentioned it. Um, now you're testing my memory. I think, I think, Critty, what pathogen did you mention? Bacteria. Very good. So Critty mentioned bacteria, which is an example of a unicellular pathogen. Bacteria are all single-celled, okay, and they're also prokaryotic. Now, when you're doing this flowchart in your book, draw it out. I need you all to appreciate using words is a crap way of studying biology. Biology is visual, right? It's a study of the, the, the body. It's a study of life. Those are visual processes. So what you can do is next to prion, you can literally just draw a protein, right? Remember, proteins can have a primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure. They'll test you on this. So do you see how there's an overlap now between your understanding of polypeptide synthesis and proteins to now prions? They will show you prions and they'll ask you to, to tell them what level of protein structure they are. So my tip again here is, Whenever you notice there's modules that have overlapping info, that's very high yield information. Okay, so protein structure is very high yield here. So maybe you can just draw a squiggle, right? This could be a protein. It's just a chain of amino acids. And uh, let's ask Rithanya, what level of protein structure is this? So let's say this is a polypeptide chain and it's got hydrogen bonds here and here between different parts of the chain. Um, and it's folded in a 3D arrangement. It's 3D globular protein. What level of protein structure is this? Um, is it quaternary? Can't hear your Thani a bit louder. Quaternary. Sorry, what was that? I can't hear you too well. It's a bit quiet. Trissy, can you help her out? What level of protein structure is this? 3D folding. That should straight away give it away to one level of structure. If you're unsure, tell us what the levels of protein structure are. Any ideas, Trissy? I, I know you probably weren't there when we learned um, this, but give it a go. I agree with you. Completely right. Primary is just a chain of amino acids that isn't folded in any way at all. Secondary is when you have um, beta sheets and alpha helixes. You don't see that being shown here, 
right? And tertiary is when it's folded in a 3D shape. So maybe to show you beta sheets and alpha helixes, it could be that this part of the protein is in a um, helical arrangement, and this part of the protein is in a is in a sheet arrangement like this. I'm not doing a very good job showing you that. But when parts of the protein are in an alpha helix and beta sheet arrangement and it's 3D folded, that's a tertiary protein. Okay, so 3D folding equals tertiary. Don't forget that. Okay, good. Now, a virus looks a bit different. A virus has a protein capsule like this. And inside of that capsule, it will have genetic information. It could be DNA or it could be RNA. It's just some form of genetic information. So maybe I shouldn't have written DNA. Maybe for all of you, I should have just written protein plus genetic info. Okay plus genetic information it can be in the form of DNA, can be in the form of RNA. Okay, and they're usually covered in this envelope that's usually made out of fat or lipid. So lipid, protein, DNA. That's what a virus looks like. We're going to come back to it. Okay, but as long as you can visualize now how these different pathogens are different. It's interesting, right? Like these aren't bad guys. They're not villains. Um, they don't have a consciousness because they're not alive. But COVID-19 has wiped out, I don't want to give you a, the wrong statistic, but last time I checked, it was ages ago. I think I checked in 2020, the death rate was like 20 mil, which is like the size of Australia got wiped out because of this virus. Right? It's interesting. It's, these, these don't have any malicious intent. They're not living. They just cause rampant disease and wipe out living organisms. Uh, Muhammad, next to you, um, can you tell us a bit about bacteria? What do they look like? You should remember this from Mod 5. How would I draw a bacteria, Muhammad? They're prokaryotic. Yes, they're prokaryotic. Unicellular. And we said they're unicellular, so I think Muhammad's explained most of it. But uh, let's, go, let's go to Sarah. Sarah, what else in a bacteria? Um, structure is unique to it. So are there any other parts of a bacteria structure apart from being single-celled, apart from it having one circular loop of DNA and little plasmid DNA in the side and little ribosomes? What are some of the features of bacteria? Um, it has a nuclear nucleotide. Yeah, it has DNA, nucleotides. Good. What I wanted to hear was, it's got a tail. You're all 60% water. You're like a huge swimming pool for these bacteria. Right right now, you have bacteria in your bloodstream. It's very tiny amounts. Who Has anyone been to the dentist recently? No? Yes. So, Muhammad, you would have the highest level of bacteria in your blood right now because when a dentist goes and, you know, scrapes around your teeth, they make little cuts in the in the gum. And that causes the bacteria in your mouth to go into your bloodstream. And that's why usually after a dental procedure, sometimes you might notice you feel a little bit lousy or you might get a very, very low grade fever. It's because it's allowed bacteria to enter in your blood. And these bacteria are doing laps around your bloodstream. They're just swimming using their tail. This is called a flagella in your bloodstream and they're going to different organs. And if you have a functional immune system, you'd wipe them out in a day or so you'd feel well. If you have HIV and you get a dental procedure, remember HIV is a disease where your immune system is wiped out by the HIV virus. Those patients will die. If there's even a small quantity of bacteria, even bacteria that aren't deadly, they will die because they don't have an immune system to fight it. Okay, good. So again, come back to bacteria. They have these flagella, which are these tails to swim, and they have these pili. These are like little tentacles, little projections that allow them to attach to surfaces, right? In pneumonia, the way that the bacteria pneumonia means infection of the lungs. The way the bacteria in pneumonia attach to the lungs is they use their, their pili to tether themselves to the little grape-like air sacs called the alveoli. They don't let go and they cause infection and they invade through the tissue and cause bleeding, etc. Okay. Very good. So now we understand bacteria. What else do we have? Let's go to uh, let's go to unicellular eukaryotes. So maybe under here we can write unicellular 
we can have prokaryotes. And we can have eukaryotes. We have two examples of eukaryotes. And then in multicellular, we have one example. And then we have another example here called parasites. And underneath them, we have two more examples. What I'm going to get you guys to try doing is try filling in the rest of this table. You can use Google if you like. Again, I'll give you 30 seconds, um, 30, 40 seconds. Quickly search what haven't we spoken about? And where does it fall in here? Okay, be right back. OK, so with eukaryotes, what are the two examples of eukaryotic unicellular organisms we have? Alyssa, we'll start with you. Um, there's protozoa and some fungi. Good, very good. Protozoa and then there's fungi that are unicellular. Very good. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about protozoa, I think I forgot who mentioned protozoa. Uh, let's just go to Matthew. What defines a protozoa in terms of its cellular structure? Matthew, any ideas? What makes something a protozoa? Not really. So I think I think Trissy, I'm not sure if Trissy mentioned protozoa or I think Alyssa. I think Alyssa, you did. So can you remind the rest of the class, what were the two things about protozoa we said? Um, I didn't say it, so I'm not sure. No. Nah. Does anyone remember what were the two things you said about protozoa? Whoever told me about protozoa? What were the two things we said? Protozoa have chromosomes, the eukaryotic. That's the first thing, right? Eukaryotic and the unicellular. That's it. It's kind of what was literally here. Eukaryotic and unicellular. So protozoa, uh, eukaryotic, unicellular. Good. And the same thing with fungi. Fungi are also eukaryotic. And they're also unicellular. So how do we differentiate a fungi that's single-celled from a protozoa? This comes down to how well you remember module five, the different kingdoms. Anyone?
Can someone tell me what the cell wall of a fungi is made out of? Titan. Very good. So we've answered the question. Protozoa do not have a cell wall. Fungi do have a cell wall. They'll test you on this. They'll give you a microscope image. And if you don't recognize what a cell wall implies about the pathogen, then you won't be able to identify it. This is what microbiologists do in the lab. Yeah, they usually, there are a lot of times in hospital where a patient gets a fever or they, they drop their blood pressure and they're really unwell with infection, but we don't know what the cause is. So what we do then is we send off their blood, we send off their urine, we send off, we do a chest x-ray, and we do a bunch of tests to find out the causative organism. Then sometimes a microbiologist will look under a microscope and see one of these organisms that you see before you. Okay, usually it's bacteria. Sometimes it's viruses and it's rarely fungi. If you see a fungal disease in someone's blood, it usually implies they have some kind of immunosuppression like HIV. Good. Now, when you talk about multicellular, you can also have fungi. So I'm not going to say um, what fungi are again, but we can also have parasites. What are the two different categories of parasites, Ruthania, since you mentioned, I think you said ectoparasite. There's ectoparasites and endoparasites. Good. Ectoparasite, endoparasite. Okay, good. So endoparasites are usually helmets. So these are macroscopic. So when we say the word parasite, everyone, we're talking about macroscopic parasites. Technically, all of these organisms are parasites. They have a parasitic relationship, meaning they harm the host. So bacteria is a parasite. A uh, virus is a parasite. A uh, protist is a parasite. Okay, so but when you say the word parasite in layperson terms, you're talking about a macroparasite, something you can see, right? So an endoparasite, which is a parasite you can see inside the body, is usually a worm. It's a huge worm. And that usually happens from eating raw meat. Raw pork, raw beef is contaminated. Even fish is, is full of parasites. Um, unfortunately, I love sushi, but I found out the other day, you know, raw sushi has a lot of these worm-like parasites. Um, a lot of them are quite microscopic. It's hard to see them. And it's just that freezing the fish um, usually kills it, but you still eat it when you, when you eat the food. Same thing with meat. Um, a lot of raw meat has, you know, these parasitic eggs. And only when you cook it does the egg die, but you still eat, um, you know, that quantity of dead parasite. But it's, all, it's, an, it's in food. Okay, good. So endoparasites. Endoparasites are helminths or worms. Helminths. The word helminth means worm. Okay. Helminth is worm. Good. And with ectoparasites, we have a range. What are some examples of ectoparasites? These critters that you can see with your visual eye that are outside the body that want your blood. We've said ticks. We've said fleas. What else do we have? Anyone? We have ticks, fleas, lice, mites. Okay, they're all examples of ectoparasites. We'll go through examples. Any questions so far about the different organisms that cause disease? This is a brief overview about what they all look like and how they're different. And hopefully in your head you can categorize this. What I would recommend is you draw this out from scratch. If you can, in three days from now, get a blank piece of paper, bring your friend at school and explain this to them, then you truly understand it. Okay, good. Sorry, give me one moment. What's happening in my mic? Good. Any questions about how these pathogens all look different? All right. What I'll try doing is I'll give you a question now. 
to test you. See how we go. Question three. I'll give you guys about a minute or a minute and a half to dot point answer this one. Okay. Can I see the raise hand icon once you've got an answer? Can you guys appreciate why this is high yield? It's mod five and seven combined, right? You're learning the kingdoms, the types of replication, and you also need to identify what pathogen it is. Good job, Alyssa. I don't see anyone else with their hand up. Sorry, my camera died. Um, let me just put it on charge. Um, give me one sec and we'll go through the answer together. Okay, so what have we got as our answer? Sarah, what do you think this pathogen is and why? Um, is it bacterial? Okay, why do you say that? Because it's, um, it's a eukaryotic cell. Are bacteria eukaryotic? No. Good. See, but, see, when you say it out loud, you reason with yourself and you come to you come to a, an answer. That's why I want you guys to think out loud, especially when you're answering these questions. Let's go to uh, Trissy. What do you think it is? Um, I'm not too sure, but I think it's a fungi because it has nucleus and cell wall. OK, so the way I would probably go about this at a, at a beginning level when you're first learning it is to quickly list out all the pathogens, right? We have bacteria, we have viruses, we have prions, we have protozoa, 
we have fungi, we have parasites. Okay, so given this is a cell straight away, Matthew, what can you cancel out out of this list? Uh, let me can cancel out already bacteria, parasites, and viruses. Good, you can take out bacteria, viruses, you can take out parasites because they're multicellular. Good. What else can we take out, Mohammed? Prions. Very good. Prions are proteins, they're not cells. So now we're left with two. Now, who remembers what the difference was between a protozoa and a fungi? Ruthania? Take it away. Which one do you think this is? I think it's fungi because protozoa has um, no cell wall, but in the diagram, it has a cell wall. Very good. Good, good. Cell wall is the key differentiating feature, right? Protozoa have no cell wall, fungi do have a cell wall. Very good. So I agree with, I think Trissi also said fungi and Ruthania said fungi, I agree with that. That's a good way to break it down. See, when you know the list and you can start cancelling out, you've got an answer. What are the modes of replication of this? Let's go to a tool. I think Atul, your mic doesn't work. Atul, can you join on your phone, please? So you you, you can you know turn your mic on and, and answer it as well. Um, meanwhile, I'll get Kriti. Kriti, how do fungi replicate? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but they like I think they asexually reproduce. Mm, really depends. Right. Uh, I, I need someone to tell me what the mode of replication is. Mohammed? Budding and spore. Good. It's budding and spore formation. Okay. So you can bud off, or a multicellular fungi can release spores that will germinate in the soil and form a new fungus right that spore formation can be sexual or asexual depending on whether the spore is a diploid spore in which case it can just germinate itself and this would be asexual or in the case if it's haploid it would need two spores to combine and if two haploid spores combine to form a diploid spore now it's sexual because there's a mixing of genetic information and you make genetically unique offspring okay Good. So the answer is budding and spore formation for multicellular fungi only. Okay. Very good. So you would have got one mark for identifying it's a fungi, one mark for justifying it's due to the cell wall and thus why it cannot be a protozoa, one mark for budding, one mark for spore formation. Mark yourself accordingly. Who got four out of four? Who got three out of four? Very good. Trissy, what did you what did you miss? Um can I can I um hear about the marking criteria again? Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So one mark for stating this has to be fungi, one mark for justifying with reference to the cell wall, and thus it cannot be a protozoa. Okay, so justifying it's eukaryotic and cell wall. One mark for budding, one mark for spore formation. I think I didn't get all the second point, like it is eukaryotic and protozoa, like not protozoa. Mm, I think it'd be important to justify why it's not a protozoa. Alyssa, what about you? What did you not state? Um, I didn't state about the budding. Good, good. All right, good job. All right, what we'll do now is you take your five minute break and uh, when you come back refreshed, we will now run through how each organism causes disease and one example. So you now you should more or less know the structures. You should now move on to how each organism causes disease and an example of each. OK, now, unfortunately, for this top one, we have to also know a bit about plants. So I'm just going to show you patterns to recognize with plant diseases. And I think the way I rationalize why um, the HC syllabus creators unfortunately made you learn about plants is 
when you see how disease occurs in plants, you really understand how it occurs in humans as well. Good. Take your break. We'll recap at about 12, 17-ish. Okay? See you guys in five.
Okay, when we're back, can you guys hit the raise hand icon? We'll get back into it. Good. All right. Now let's talk about how each pathogen causes disease. We're going to start small and then work our way up to the biggest pathogen. OK, that's how I like to think about it in my head when we say the word pathogen. So, Kriti, what is the smallest pathogen that we have now? Little tree of pathogens here. What would you say is the smallest? If you had to hazard a guess. The prions? Very good. So what I've actually drawn, guys, is not a good scale of how big everything is. It's just to show you what it looks like. In reality, if I was to show you, I can I can try here. A protein might be a dot, which would make a virus look this big, which would make a bacteria look as big as the entire page, probably as big as three pages. That's how big a bacteria would be. And then eukaryotes would be a bit bigger than that. And then we go to multicellular organisms with fungi and et cetera. OK, just so you appreciate the scale of things. A dot is a prion compared to a virus compared to a bacteria. Good. All right. And a human cell would probably be about, you know, 10 pages in, in size, width and um, length. But good. All right. So starting with how prions work. Prions are simply proteins that are folded in a specific way. These prion proteins are found in brain cells specifically. OK, so another name for a brain cell is a neuron. Maybe I'll draw it to the side. Here, so if this was a brain cell here. We zoom into the structure. We have prions that exist in the cell membrane. OK, and they're folded like this. We don't know why they're there, but there's a few hypotheses. One hypothesis is that these normal prion proteins, they protect brain cells from oxidative damage. Now, you might remember from mod six that metabolism in cells creates free radical species, these reactive chemicals that want to rip electrons off everything and damage it. That's one of the waste products of a cell. These prion proteins help neutralize and destroy the free radicals, which improves survivability of those cells. OK, you do not for the HSC need to know why prions are there, but it's just for those of you who are genuinely curious and it will help your understanding overall. OK, now. There are a few ways this can happen and we'll talk about this shortly, but a prion can misfold from its normal configuration into an infectious configuration. Let me just maybe do infectious configuration like this. OK, so now you can clearly see it is misfolded into an infectious configuration. When that happens. This prion protein can now bind to other normal prions. Right? So this could be another normal prion. It can bind to it and cause it to also misfold into an infectious configuration. And that prion can force another normal prion to misfold and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's kind of like a domino effect. So the key point here is that when a prion goes from its normal configuration to an infectious configuration, it now serves as a template where it can bind to normal prions and induce them to misfold. And very shortly, over a couple of months to years, you can imagine all the normal prion proteins in that brain cell and in the surrounding brain cells will get misfolded into an infectious configuration. Is everyone with me at a, at a cellular level as to where these normal prions are, why they're there? And when they misfold, the domino or consequential effect of that. Any questions so far? Good. All right. So now when we zoom out, right, this is one brain cell, but when we zoom out and we have a look at the entire tissue itself, 
this is a tissue in the brain, you can see that what ends up happening is these misfolded prions, they join and they form these long tangles. You can see them here, these long tangles of toxic fibers that cause the death of brain cells. All right, so all you need to say for your exams is that these infectious prions are toxic, they damage brain cells. And can you all appreciate how under a microscope, they're causing hole-like lesions in the pink, healthy, normal brain tissue. These are all holes where cells should be, but now it's just empty space because of mass cell death. And that's why we say these prions cause spongy form disease in the brain. Spongy form disease. Okay. Very good. Now, one point to mention with this misfolding is this is exactly what a normal and an abnormal prion looks like. Okay. Normal prion proteins in the brain are in an alpha helix structure. When they misfold, they misfold into a beta sheet structure. So this links to your to your HSC mod five knowledge of proteins, right? Normal prions are in an alpha helix. When they misfold, they form these beta sheets that now mean they're in an infectious configuration. Okay, and here's this little image to show you how prions are acting. So you can see when a prion misfolds, it now has this template site where it can bind to other normal prions. We're completely unaware of being bound to, and it can force them to now misfold as well into other infectious prions. Good. All right. Now, what you see here, everyone, this pink image here, the way you imagine this is, can you see, can you see my face, right? I want you to imagine that you get a, a knife and you chop it straight down the front like this, right? So when you look at a brain, now this is what you see. Can everyone appreciate the, the axis here? So you get the front of someone's face and it's like putting a crown on their head, but that crown just slices them vertically down the body. This is what you see with the brain. OK, but the main thing I want you to appreciate is a normal brain. It has these little grooves called gyri, but it's still large and pink. In a prion disease brain, you can see it's all shriveled up. You can see how much volume has been lost in the brain. And you can see that these normal grooves are extremely accentuated. That's a groove instead of just being there to there. Right. So that's what a happens to a brain in prion disease. Key things you need to know for your exams is normal prions induce other prions to misfold, and this causes spongy form disease of the brain because the long toxic prion proteins are toxic to neurons. You then need to know an example of prion disease. Ruthanya, what's an example of prion disease you learned at school? Um, fatal familial insomnia. Did you learn that from here or did you learn it from school? I had that written in my book. Oh, at school. Very good. All right. FFI. It's interesting. There's FFI is inherited. And that's why I didn't tell you earlier, everyone, why, what causes those prion proteins up here to misfold, right? I said something causes them to misfold. There's different causes, right? What I mean to say there is one of the causes is genetics. This is this might confuse you a bit because you're thinking, well, wait a minute, we, we're talking about infectious disease. Why are we talking about genetics, which refers to non-infectious disease? Well, this is where it kind of blurs a little bit. Prion diseases especially, because they're so unique and different to everything else. So prion diseases, they can misfold due to genetics, where you can inherit prion diseases. In fact, there are a few families, Italian families, who have fatal familial insomnia in their lineage. So people in the family know that when they have children, the children will get or have a high likelihood of getting fatal familial insomnia. What do those words mean? Fatal, deadly, familial, it runs in the family. Insomnia, cannot sleep. So FFI is a disease where these patients cannot sleep. The reason that happens is it damages brain cells that are responsible for your normal circadian sleep-wake cycle. Okay, so genetics, some prion diseases can be inherited. 
prion diseases can be inherited. Can be inherited. What was our example? FFI or fatal familial insomnia. Good. What are some other examples? Has anyone learned any other prion diseases? Okay. You guys have to Google search this, right? I'm not going to Google search it for you, but I want you to search up the word Kuru on the internet. Get your phone out and search K-U-R-U. -U. I'm not searching it only because the images are quite, quite graphic and confronting, right? But when you look at Kuru, the first image you'll see can you guys hit the race hand icon when, you, when you've searched Kuru and you've opened up the first image? This is just so you can appreciate these are real things. They're not, we're not doing theoretical physics. We're not doing, you know, quantum chemistry. This is real diseases affecting real people. Good. Anyone else search it up? Good. Ruthani has got it up. First image when you search Kuru, right? Uh, Ruthani, can you describe what you see to the class? Um, like an extremely skinny child that can't stand, I think. Very good, right? So this is showing you what Kuru does. Kuru is a disease that's transmitted not through genetics, but through direct contact. And the reason it was transmitted is, and I think it was New Guinea, there are still cannibalistic tribes, or there were back, you know, a couple hundred years or so. And those cannibalistic tribes used to eat the brains of deceased individuals. And one of those people had prion disease and consumption of brain tissue led to the infected prions traveling into the body of the next person who ate the deceased individual, traveling to the brain and forcing all of their prions to misfold. So just to show you that prion diseases can be transmitted through genetics that can cause a normal prion to misfold, or it can be transmitted through direct contact, aka consumption of prion protein, consumption of prion tissue. Okay, an example of that is Kuru. And you can see what's happened to this child. What Kuru does is it, it destroys the motor neurons or the nerves in the brain or the brain cells that are responsible for movement. So these children, eventually, they can't walk, they can't stand, they won't be able to swallow, they won't be able to eat. And it's very interesting, it impairs their movement, but it also makes them mute. A lot of, a lot of prion disease eventually result in the person not being able to speak even, and they die because of not enough nutrition, not enough intake of food, etc. Okay, so that's what Kuru does. Good. Now... These are two rare ones. As you understand, FFI usually happens in those Italian families you already know about, Kuru's and cannibalistic tribes in New Guinea. There's one that's a little bit more common, and it goes by the name CJD. CJD. Ruthania, any ideas what CJD stands for? I'm asking you only because you've finished Mod 7. No, I haven't came across this. Okay, CJD stands for Kreutzfeldt. Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Okay, and it's the most common prion disease that we have on this planet. Now, we don't know what causes the prions to misfold in Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Um, sometimes it's spontaneous. This is a scary thing. Prion diseases can misfold just randomly. So theoretically, the prions in your brain or the prions in my brain can just randomly decide to misfold due to some form of error, which we don't really understand just yet. And once they misfold, the individual will get CJD. And interestingly, the way this presents is like dementia, memory problems, forgetfulness, and eventually it causes death as well. And it's usually only often diagnosed after a person dies and we look at their brain under a microscope and we realize Shit, this was never dementia. This was actually a prion disease, which we never picked up. It's quite rare. So it can happen spontaneously. CJD can also be inherited, which is a bit rarer. Okay. And you can also be transmitted. 
So there are certain cows that have mad cow disease, which is the cow version of CJD. And consumption of beef tissue, consumption of infected food, e.g. beef, has been responsible for a small set of CJD cases as well. You don't need to memorize all of this, guys. Pick one of these diseases, and as long as you can understand, it can be inherited or it can be transmitted through direct contact, or it can be spontaneous. Those are the three ways prions can misfold. Inherited, spontaneous, meaning we don't know how, it just randomly happens, and direct contact. Any questions so far? All right, let's move on to viruses. So we've gone through prions, we've gone through how they cause disease. So you can see these are the different types. It can just spontaneously happen. It can be inherited. And you can see spontaneous is the vast majority, which is a scary part, right? Prion disease can just happen to you or I. But just appreciate, it's very, very, very rare. I've never seen a patient with prion disease in my seven years of being at hospital. You will... You will never see someone with prion disease. I think there's only like 700 cases on this planet per year. Okay. And then a very, very small subset can be caused by contaminated meat. And in the olden times, um, when we didn't sterilize medical, I wouldn't say olden times, really 100 years ago, when we didn't sterilize medical equipment after brain surgery and we operated on someone else, um, sometimes prion diseases were transmitted that way. Very rare again. Very, very rare. Trissy, question? Um, this might be quite a strange question, but I was just wondering if um, if there's like a prion disease like outside of the brain, because like the three examples Good. that we just know is within the yeah. brain. Is there, Good. It's like prion disease outside of the brain. Will it have any effect? Very good question. Um, and the answer is when a prion misfolds outside of the brain. So let's say that uh, you do a skin graft surgery on a patient, and the skin you grafted has abnormal prions. Those abnormal prion proteins will travel via nerves to the brain, and they'll eventually cause prion disease. So the answer is yes. You know, any transmission of prion disease to the body, it can theoretically cause a prion protein or allow it to travel via nerves to the brain and then cause prion disease. Any other questions? This is the scary part, right? This is the only disease which has a 100% fatality rate or mortality rate. Very few other diseases. Um, the only other one I can think of is, uh, what's it called? Rabies. Rabies, after a month, if you don't get the rabies medications and if you leave it untreated after being bitten by a dog, etc., um, it's 100% fatal. The reason a lot of people don't die from rabies today is a lot of people are smart. Right after they get bitten by a dog, they get the rabies vaccine, which protects them. Good. Nice. All right, let's go to viruses. All right. Who can remind me what a virus looks like? Let's go to Matthew. What does a virus look like? Is it just like a, a cell without a cell wall, isn't it? It's not, it's not a cell because there's no organelles. Uh, let's go to Sarah. What does the virus look like, Sarah? Um, is it a 3D folded version? No, that's a, it's a protein. Alyssa, what does a virus look like? Um, I'm asking you. It... Yep. Yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off. I'm asking you all this because I I drew what a virus looks like, right? And hopefully you all drew it as well. So just go back to your image. But Alyssa. Um, it's like non-living, and it's got like a space filled with its genetic material that it then like injects into other cells. Very good. So it has a space with its genetic material. So first thing she's identified is it has genetic material. It can be DNA or RNA. Last time I drew DNA, so this time I'm just going to draw RNA. And then around it is protein. It's a DNA wrapped around a protein capsid. Kind of looks like a 
you know, a rocket ship. If any of you guys do physics, usually the pod, which the, you know, in a big rocket, the only part that, because most of it is fuel, right? The only part where people exist is like right here in this little space here. And that's a protective insulative layer. And that's all contains fuel to get it up, right? So it kind of looks like that ends. That's how I remember. But it's a capsid, protein capsid. And surrounding that, usually, some viruses don't have this, is an envelope, right? A coating of fat. And the scientific name for fat is lipid that is surrounding this protein capsid. Okay, that's what a virus looks like. So all of you should be saying a virus consists of genetic material enclosed in a protein capsid that can be either enveloped or it may be non-enveloped. If you say that in the HSC, full marks, tick, tick, tick. Any questions with how a virus looks like? Because I noticed a few, you know, we didn't all understand exactly what it looks like. Do we have any questions? Ask away now. Very good. Good job. All right. So the question is, is a virus living? Look at this and tell me. Do you think a virus is living or not? Can you guys see the raise hand icon if you think a virus is living? And keep your hand down if you think a virus is non-living. Okay, so everyone thinks a virus is non-living. Um, why do we think that? Let's go to... Uh, Trissy, why do you think a virus is non-living? Um, I think it's because it requires a host. Good. It yeah, so this is the thing. It's still a debate among scientists as to whether a virus is living or non-living. The reason we think it could be living is it contains DNA. Or well, RNA has genetic material that all life forms have. The reason we think it's not alive is because it cannot replicate independently. It needs a host. Cannot replicate independently. It needs a host. And very good. The way that viruses work, everyone, is they need to, so if this is a tiny little virus, needs to first get into a cell. And once it's into a cell, it's going to do two things. Number one, it'll go to the nucleus to make more copies of its viral DNA. Remember, the nucleus has polymerase. It has primers. It has ligase. It has the enzymes or machinery to make new viral DNA. And then what a virus will do is it'll also go to those ribosomes and it will allow for the production of new viral proteins. So it'll make new viral protein capsules. And then eventually the virus will assemble those two things together and it will make new virus. And eventually when those viruses burst out of a cell, the cell will die. So can you see that a virus, it's, it's kind of like a, it's like a clingy partner, right? It, it can't live by itself. It needs to attach to this host cell. It needs to use and leach its nutrients. It needs to take its enzymes for DNA replication to make its own genetic material. It needs to bind to ribosomes to make new viral proteins. And then it will assemble itself. And when it leaves the cell, it will puncture the cell and the cell will die. Any questions about how a virus works? Let me just show you an image. So this is a beautiful image showing you exactly what a virus looks like. Right, so remember, this is the genetic material we said. This is a protein capsid. This is a lipid envelope. Remember, it's made out of lipid and it's an envelope. And then one thing I didn't mention is that these viruses also have these proteins on their surface. And these proteins, the way you can think of them is they're kind of like keys. Right, these envelope proteins. They're like keys that allow the virus to lock, pick, and enter cells. So the cell that a virus infects is dependent on what this key looks like. In the case of HIV, this key 
would be the exact key needed to get inside of white blood cells, which are the immune cells of the body. And that's why HIV destroys only white blood cells, because these envelope proteins act as a key to unlock receptors on the white blood cell. Now, any questions so far? OK, that was a test one. I asked you that because none of you would know what viral tegument means. The word viral tegument just refers to other proteins the virus has that will help it replicate in addition to the host cell enzymes. So usually viruses have a couple of enzymes. They have an enzyme called integrase. They have a viral polymerase. They have a reverse transcriptase. We'll talk about those very shortly. But there are specific viral enzymes that will help the virus to, to use your host cell machinery. And that's what the viral tegument is. You don't need to worry about the word tegument. Just understand these additional viral proteins that the virus will use to divide, replicate, and grow. Any questions? Okay. Good, good, good. So here's another image showing you how viruses work. Now, a virus doesn't normally look like this. This looks like an insect, right? This is a specific kind of a virus known as a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages are viruses that only infect bacteria. Only those viruses look like this. They have these like tentacle-like arms. It's pretty crazy because they're not even alive. But have a look at, you know, they look a lot like spiders. Right? It's pretty nasty. But that's what viruses, that's what they, they actually look like. It's pretty crazy. Good. Any questions? Okay. Now I'm going to explain how a virus works in a little bit more detail because you all need to understand. Let me go to, to here. This is a part where I need you all to pay attention because it's going to go into a bit more detail and this is going to tie in your understanding of DNA replication, polypeptide synthesis, etc. Okay, so this is a cell. It has a nucleus and it has ribosomes. Now we've got our virus here. And inside this virus is RNA. Okay, it's an RNA virus. Now, what did we say the viral tegument or the viral proteins are used for? Let's go to Critty. What is the what are those viral proteins like integrase, reverse transcriptase? What does it what does it do for the virus? Oh, didn't we say that they like help replicate? Good. Yeah, that's quite literally it. They help it use your host cell machinery and replicate. Now I'm going to explain how that works. Okay. So remember, this is an RNA virus. Okay. Now, does everyone appreciate the enzymes used in your cell to DNA replicate are DNA polymerase, DNA primers? ligase which only works on dna so you need to appreciate your host cell enzymes for dna replication only work on dna but this is an rna virus so how on earth is it going to replicate its rna when the enzymes used to replicate inside your cell are dna based the way it does that is it has a protein called reverse transcriptase can anyone tell me what does reverse transcriptase or that enzyme do? This is a very valid HSC question. And I'll pass it on to Matthew. Matthew, can you infer what process the reverse transcriptase would allow the virus to do? Very good. Oh, so a bit, sorry, a bit louder. Turn DNA into RNA. That's transcription. What would reverse transcription mean? RNA into DNA. Very good. Good job. So reverse transcriptase tells you this is an enzyme that's going to reverse transcription, aka convert 
So there's a lot of sirens. Let me just quickly turn, close that door, I'll be right back. Okay, so like I was saying, reverse transcriptase is going to reverse transcription or convert the viral RNA into viral DNA. And now when the viral DNA enters the cell, it can get from one copy of DNA into multiple copies of viral DNA. Okay, I'm drawing DNA like letters just for simplicity, right? Very good. Now, there are other enzymes like integrase. Um, integrase is another enzyme in viruses. And what integrase does is integrase will insert the viral DNA into the host cell's DNA. So you can imagine if this green is the host cell's DNA and chromosomes, so this is your DNA and chromosomes, integrase, maybe do it in green, integrase will allow, which will integrate the viral DNA into the host genome. And what that allows the virus to do is even if your immune cells destroy all of the virus, if your proteins decide to replicate this sequence of DNA, it will accidentally translate, transcribe, and DNA replicate viral DNA and make more virus. And so the implication of this is that viruses that have integrase can become incurable. In the case of HIV, that's because even if you wipe out all of the HIV, the HIV DNA is inside your cells. It's a part of your cell DNA now. So you can accidentally transcribe and translate HIV proteins. You can accidentally replicate HIV DNA and you make new HIV virus. Interestingly, remember what I told you, only 2% of your DNA actually codes for proteins. Our hypothesis as to the other 98% is a vast majority of it was DNA from viruses that did this very thing. So our ancestors were infected by viruses that had integrase, and they inserted their viral DNA into their genome, and when your ancestors passed on their DNA, DNA and hereditary information, you inherited that junk viral DNA. It's not used, it doesn't code for anything, but it's ancient viral DNA inside of your cells. Good, this is all extra information, only because it very much can show you a diagram of reverse transcriptase and integrase and ask you questions in relation to DNA replication. So I just wanted to introduce it to you. So if you do see it in the HC exams or your trials, you're a bit more confident with understanding it, okay? But you don't need to memorize all this stuff. The key thing you need to memorize is what a virus looks like and just the general overview that it uses host cell polymerase, uses host cell transcription translation to make new virus. Any questions? Good. What are some examples of viral diseases that we know? Please don't say COVID. Please don't say COVID. What other examples do we have? Uh, let's go to Trissy. Do you know any viral diseases apart from COVID, Trissy? Um, smallpox. Yeah, very good. Right. So smallpox, it's eradicated. So I wouldn't really remember smallpox only because it's not too useful. You know, if you do go into healthcare at all, because you'll never ever see it. And if you do it, it probably means there's some kind of global biological warfare going on. It should not be in the community. Uh, Sarah, what's another common virus? I'll give you a hint. There is a virus that will infect you one to three times per year, every single year, give you a runny nose and a sore throat for a couple of days, and then you get better. What virus am I talking about? Influenza. I was talking about the cold, but very good. The cold consists, the reason it's called a cold is called by 50 different viruses. Okay, and that's why there's no vaccine for the cold. You can't make a vaccine for 50 different viruses that all do the same thing. These group of viruses, they all mutate as well, and they infect your upper respiratory tract, and so you get a runny nose, a sore throat for a couple of days. The next time you get it, just remember this, this lesson, 
I'm diagnosing you preemptively. That is a cold. Sore throat, runny nose, a little bit of a headache for three days, definitely less than a week. That is a cold. How do you treat it? It's not deadly, so can't really do much. Take a throat lozenge. Um, yeah, it's not, not much you can do. Hydrate yourself and rest. The flu is completely different. So the example one I gave you was cold, which is caused by a group of viruses. Viruses that infect the upper airway, aka the throat. An example of a virus that causes a cold is adenovirus, adenovirus, etc. Okay, or rhinovirus. These are just two different viruses that cause a cold. Okay, just pick one. Another more common, another equally common infection, and this usually happens in the winter time. This one is much more deadly. This one has the potential to kill little children and elderly people. So you should hope that you know grandparents, elderly people do not get this. And this is the flu or influenza. Now notice the difference, everyone. The cold group of viruses, mild illness, influenza is caused by only one virus. And it's easy to remember. The name of the virus is the influenza virus. How easy was that? Influenza caused by influenza virus. Okay. This virus additionally will cause fevers, body aches, and will be around for about two weeks. Next time you get sick, if you get fevers, if your joints feel achy, you're definitely bed bound and you can't really get around and it lasts for seven days or longer, you probably have the flu. Okay, it's caused by the influenza virus. It also infects the upper airway, but it also causes fever as well. So it's a severe illness. Okay, and influenza has a vaccine. So especially old people and children, we recommend them get vaccinated every year. Okay, does anyone understand why we need to get vaccinated every year for influenza? Trissy? I think it, it's because it mutates. Very good. Good job. It's very interesting how we create the vaccine for influenza. We start making it in summer. And what we do is we look at the northern hemisphere and we look at the mutations that the influenza virus has in the northern hemisphere and we use that to predict what the influenza virus will look like when it hits us in winter. So by the time we're in winter, there's a new updated vaccine for the new subtypes of influenza. Right? That's what your um, epidemiologists, the, the doctors that work with public health and global health, work on and microbiologists as well. Okay, very good, good. I'll give you one interesting one. HIV is an interesting virus to remember. Again, you don't need to memorize all of these. Just remember one. But I feel like this stuff is general people knowledge. Be good if, you know, lay people remember this as well. So they knew what they needed to go to the doctor for and what doesn't really need a doctor. For a cold, you don't need antibiotics. Antibiotics are caused by bacteria. This is a viral infection. People should not be taking antibiotics for a cold because when they actually need antibiotics, they're going to be useless because of resistance. Influenza, on the other hand, there are some antiviral medications you can take for influenza. Um, so that's why to just generally understand cold versus influenza. HIV, again, to help you out, is caused by HIV virus. How easy was that? HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus. You might be wondering, then HIV virus means human immunodeficiency virus virus. Isn't that repetition? You're completely right, but we still say HIV virus. Okay, so HIV caused by the HIV virus and it infects T cells, which are, Ruthania, what are T cells? Can you explain to the class briefly? Like um, lymphocytes, the white blood cells. Good, the white blood cells. Just remember the white blood cells. And white blood cells fight infection. 
Good. So we've gone through viruses. We've gone through how they work. And now you have three pretty good examples to use in your exams as well. Any questions, everyone? Good. Can you all realize mod five and six is like, they're kind of like their own thing. It's all genetics, genetic technology, biodiversity, all that stuff. Mod seven is their own separate topic, infectious disease. Okay. And then mod eight is a non-infectious disease. Good. Good. All right. Well, on that note, we'll finish up for today. Now, just to remind everyone, can you all just make sure your invoices are finalized? Because Monday, I'm going to send out, I'm going to print, get off flex, print, bind, and post all your booklets. So just make sure on your end, everything is finalized. Because otherwise, I'm only going to probably do it once. So it might get very delayed if things aren't ready by Monday. Okay, so just Monday morning, I'll send all your notes out. You should get it sometime in the week. Okay, there's the mod seven notes and the mod seven um, trial questions as well. Good. All right, have a good week. Take it easy. Take a break after this class. You guys all worked hard for two hours. So take a break and timetable yourself. And I'll see you all next Sunday. Bye. Mohamed, question? I get the note and the buy WhatsApp online. Wait one moment. Um, don't know why it says. Let me just stop the recording. <laughs>